one of the things is reframe, right? Take all of that nervous, awful energy and develop a way to almost counter it. Like a little statement, like, this is gonna be okay. If I get things wrong or it goes badly, it's only one day, it's only one thing. It's only one exam. Whatever your, your like little mantra, whatever your little thing that you might say in your head to try to reframe it. But the other way to do it is instead of just saying, well, it's going to be fine and don't worry about it, if you can, is to take all those nervous things, right? Like, like if you think about feeling nervous and you think about feeling excited, they're actually very similar, right? It's just how you think about them. When you're feeling excited, you may also be a bit jumpy and shaky, right? Your hands may also be a bit sweaty. You may also feel a bit like, you know, short of breath and a bit red and maybe your mind is racing. And when you feel nervous, you feel lots of those similar things. So if you can turn that dial over time to take all of those physiological feelings of nerves and reframe the way your mind thinks about them into excitement, it's a really very useful way and it takes time. It's not going to happen right away and you're absolutely going to fail at it, right? You're going to have like really good days and really, really bad days at it and it's kind of like an ongoing process. But if you can, the more you can push that dial from nervous to excitement, the better um, experience you're going to have. Because I think the thing to keep in mind is that, that the sad thing about nerves, right, is that it stops you from being the best <laughs> in the world but it also robs the world of what you have to say. And this is a real two-way street, and I think it's hard to feel like what I have to say is really important and matters, and, and the world will be worse off because I, I haven't said it. But it's actually true, because when you multiply that among millions and millions of people who don't speak up because of those nerves, how many great ideas, how many great perspectives, how many allies are we, are we losing out on because of those nerves? So it's really your responsibility to help turn that dial um, the other thing is to have like a, almost like a ritual. Comedians have this, right? I've, I've worked, I have a lot of friends who are comedians, and I've worked with them, and I, the first time I did it, I was like, what is going on? Like, these are these bubbly, kind of confident people on stage, and then backstage, they won't speak to anyone for like an hour. They'll like sit in a room with their back to everyone facing a wall, like totally in their zone. They'll just have a bit of water, They'll like be practicing and they'll be calm and they won't let anyone else in. Now, you may not need that extreme. Maybe your kind of comfort ritual might be having a cup of coffee or talking to some friends or listening to some music or whatever it might be. But de developing a way to calm yourself down is really useful because you can use that in so many different spaces. Um, and then obviously there's this idea of what do you do when you're nervous on stage, right? Like in those moments. So one of them is, I always, whenever I'm coaching speakers who are going to give like a big talk, I'm like, you've got, you know, you've got like your kind of couple of steps. First, you breathe. First, well, first you pause. And if it doesn't come to you, like what you're going to say or you're not feeling better, then you take a deep breath. If it still doesn't come to you, then you take a drink of water. If it still doesn't come to you, you take a little walk inside of the stage. You're all of the time buying yourself a bit of time to calm down, to, to kind of to go back in your mind if you've forgotten about what you want to say or your mind's going blank. And actually, it may seem really awkward to you to pause. Like it might feel like a lifetime. But what it's actually done, especially if you're someone like me and you speak very quickly, is it's given the poor audience a chance to also breathe, to also absorb what you've just said and then to keep going. So the idea is, is that you think about what you're going to do before you, to, you do something that's nerve wracking, whether it be an exam or a performance or a talk. And then you've got things, strategies in your mind of what you're going to do during. And one of them, which I love, is the safety net, right? Also a trick I learned from comedians. Often you'll see comedians on stage with like a bottle of beer. What you don't see is on the back of that, they have a sticky label with their set list. Like each of the jokes in the right order stuck on the back of the bottle. And so if they forget the order of the jokes, because everything is so planned, they reach for their bottle, they take a drink, and they've got it. Now, I'm not suggesting that you get up with a bottle of beer every time you're going to give a talk or performance, but having a note card in your pocket, right, with the five things you have to say, no, no problem, right? It ends up being the fifth step. First you, first you uh, breathe, first you pause, then you breathe, then you have water, then you take a walk, and then worst comes to worst, you just 
pull this out of your pocket, you have a quick look, and you're on your way. So I think having these strategies and thinking about it, because I think one of the things about being nervous is you don't want to think about being nervous, right? Like it's not a pleasant thought to sit there constantly being like, let me imagine the time I was most nervous last and how it felt. But you need to kind of embrace that in order to then come up with ideas of how to solve it, right? It's like everything. If you don't think about it, if you don't understand it, there's no way you're going to kind of counteract it. Um, and the last thing I think someone said here is that most people that you will care about listening to you don't want you to fail. In most audiences that you're in front of, people don't want you to fail. None of you, I hope, maybe some of you are, which is cool, are sitting there thinking about me. Oh, I hope she does terribly. I hope she totally fails. I hope her mind goes blank and that she's totally embarrassed and runs out the room. Most of you, because, because also that's not a good experience for you, right? Like that would be like a horrible experience in the audience and it'd be a horrible experience for me. And so you have to think about it when you're speaking. Most people are not sitting there going, I can't wait till this person fails. I can't wait till they totally forget what they're going to say. What they, wanted, what they want in the audience is to listen to you, to be interested and excited and curious and made curious by what you're going to say. So your job is to do those things and not worry that they're going to think that what you're saying is boring or uninteresting. And there will always be some. There will always be some people who do not want to hear what you have to say and who will be like that. But actually, those are not really the people 99% of the time that you're going to want to speak to. I mean, I don't know if any of you are familiar with like the show Dragon's Den. Yeah, you know, a little bit where you get to, you, you're a business person, you pitch to like five billionaires or millionaires who then like rip you apart and then they give you money if, if you survive that. Like, sorry, that's my summary of this show. Like, <laughs> that is not life. Like, like, you very rarely are in those situations where someone is there to like purposely rip you apart. So, so do try to find those smiling, friendly faces in the audience. You know, I still do it. I will look at the people who are smiling at me, who are nodding at me. So I'm like, yes, people are hearing me. It's OK. I'm making sense. I'm not rambling. Let's keep going.